It was just past ten o'clock when the shrill buzz of the emergency room's entrance pierced the quiet night. I, Rachel Smith, was seated at my desk in the small rural hospital, struggling to stay awake. My eyes were fixed on the stack of paperwork before me, and my thoughts were drifting when the door flew open with a jarring crash. In walked a man, dragging a large axe behind him. My heart raced as I glanced up, barely able to comprehend the scene unfolding before me. The man, whose name I would later learn was Jackson Wells, was a picture of disarray. His clothes were tattered, his face smeared with sweat and grime, and his eyes were wide with a mixture of terror and irritation. The sight of the axe, coupled with his frantic demeanor, made my pulse quicken. I froze for a moment, my mind grappling with the reality of the situation. Jackson did not say a word. He simply strode toward me with an almost predatory determination. My breath caught in my throat as I tried to steady my trembling hands. I knew I had to act quickly, but the sheer fear I felt was almost paralyzing. Jackson started pounding on the doors, his rage manifesting in loud, frantic thuds. Let me in! Let me in! He shouted repeatedly, his voice edged with desperation. His fury was palpable, and I could see that he was on the brink of a complete breakdown. The sound of the axe scraping against the floor added to the overwhelming tension. With shaking hands, I reached for the phone, trying to maintain some semblance of composure. My mind raced as I dialed the emergency number. Please, we need help immediately, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We have a patient with an axe. He's becoming violent. The dispatcher's calm voice on the other end was a small comfort. They assured me that a patrol car was on its way, but in the meantime, I was left to deal with the situation as best I could. I knew that every second counted, and every second felt like an eternity. As if on cue, the commotion escalated. Jackson's shouts grew louder, his movements more erratic. He slammed into the doors with such force that I worried they might give way. I could hear the metallic groan of the hinges and feel the vibrations through the floor. The emergency room, usually so quiet and controlled, was now a scene of chaos. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, a figure appeared at the end of the corridor. It was Dr. Gregory Hill, our on-call physician, his expression a mask of determined calm. He stepped into the room with an air of authority that seemed to cut through the panic. The sight of him was a small relief amidst the storm of fear. Dr. Hill approached Jackson, speaking in a low, steady voice. Jackson, calm down. We're here to help you. His demeanor was the epitome of professionalism. He moved carefully, trying to de-escalate the situation with a combination of calm words and measured actions. His voice, though firm, was soothing, like a balm to the frayed nerves of everyone present. Jackson's anger seemed to waver slightly, and for a brief moment his focus shifted to Dr. Hill. The doctor continued to speak, his tone never rising above a gentle, controlled register. He gestured slowly, trying to diffuse the tension. Within minutes, the police arrived, their presence bringing an additional layer of security to the fraught situation. I watched with a mixture of awe and relief as they assessed the scene. Dr. Hill had managed to keep Jackson under control until they arrived, his calm authority helping to avert a potential disaster. The police quickly took over, ensuring that Jackson was safely restrained and escorted out. As they worked, one of the officers approached me to gather details about what had happened. I struggled to articulate the events through the haze of shock, but I managed to provide the necessary information. Dr. Hill, ever the professional, took me aside and offered a comforting cup of coffee. As we sat in the quiet aftermath of the ordeal, he explained that he had dealt with similar situations before. His calm demeanor was not just a facade, but a critical part of his role. He reassured me that while such events were distressing, they were part of the reality of working in an emergency room. The police began their investigation, questioning Jackson and piecing together the story behind his violent outburst. It would later be revealed that he had been suffering from a severe psychological crisis exacerbated by personal tragedies and relentless stress. His actions, though alarming, were driven by desperation rather than malice. As the night wore on, I found myself reflecting on the harrowing events. The emergency room slowly returned to its normal rhythm, but the intensity of the night lingered in my mind. I realized that working in a place like this required not just medical expertise, but also emotional fortitude. 
The night had tested me in ways I hadn't anticipated, but it also deepened my understanding of the complex human experiences we encounter in this field. As dawn approached, I knew that despite the fear and chaos, I was proud of how I had handled the situation. This was just another chapter in the unpredictable world of emergency medicine, and while the night had been anything but ordinary, I felt a renewed sense of resolve to continue facing whatever came next with courage and compassion. The sun rose reluctantly, casting a pale light over the small hospital, as if unsure whether to embrace the new day. Exhausted from the previous night's ordeal, I stumbled through my morning routine, my mind replaying the events like a relentless loop. Despite the comfort of a warm shower and the soothing aroma of coffee, the shadow of the night lingered over me. By the time I arrived at the hospital, the emergency room had returned to its usual calm. The staff went about their tasks with their usual efficiency, but there was an unspoken undercurrent of concern. It wasn't every day that a violent incident occurred in our quiet corner of the world. As I settled into my shift, Dr. Gregory Hill was already at work, his demeanor as composed as ever. He greeted me with a nod and a reassuring smile. How are you holding up? he asked, his tone both genuine and professional. I'm okay, I replied, trying to sound more certain than I felt. Last night was intense. I keep replaying it in my head. Dr. Hill's eyes were kind but serious. It's natural to feel that way. What happened last night was highly unusual. But remember, it's part of our job to handle these situations as best we can. I nodded, though his words did little to ease the gnawing anxiety in my chest. My thoughts kept drifting back to Jackson Wells. Who was he, and what drove him to such desperation? I found myself wanting to know more, not just out of curiosity, but out of a deep sense of responsibility. The hospital was quiet that morning, and as the day wore on, I had a chance to review the reports from the night before. I was pulled from my routine when one of the police officers from the previous night, Officer Ryan Lewis, came by to follow up. He had a calm, authoritative presence and seemed to sense my unease. We've been working on Jackson Wells' case, Officer Lewis began. I thought you might be interested in some details, given what you went through last night. Absolutely, I said, my interest piqued. I'd like to understand what happened. Officer Lewis explained that Jackson had been experiencing severe mental distress, which had been exacerbated by ongoing personal issues. He had recently lost his job and was grappling with the loss of a close family member. His psychological state had deteriorated to the point where he felt overwhelmed and saw no other escape. The axe wasn't meant to be a weapon, Officer Lewis clarified. He brought it with him as a symbol of his frustration and helplessness. It was more a cry for help than an actual threat. The revelation hit me hard. Jackson wasn't a villain. He was a man in the midst of an emotional and mental collapse. The thought of him struggling alone with his pain made me realize how fragile the line between sanity and madness could be. As the day progressed, I found myself reflecting on Jackson's situation. I decided to speak with Dr. Hill again, hoping to gain further insight into the mental health aspects of our job. Dr. Hill was in his office, reviewing patient files. I knocked softly and entered. Do you have a moment? I asked. Of course, Rachel, he said, gesturing for me to sit. What's on your mind? I've been thinking a lot about Jackson Wells and his condition, I admitted. What can you tell me about dealing with patients in such distress? How do you manage to stay calm? Dr. Hill leaned back in his chair, considering my question. It's crucial to approach each patient with empathy and understanding. People in crisis often don't act rationally. Our goal is to provide them with a safe environment and help them find the support they need. In Jackson's case, his aggression was a manifestation of his inner turmoil. I listened intently, absorbing every word. And how do you avoid getting overwhelmed yourself? It's challenging, Dr. Hill said with a thoughtful expression. You need to maintain a balance. Professionalism helps, but so does self-care. Talking to colleagues, taking time to decompress, and acknowledging your own feelings are important. Our conversation was a valuable learning experience. As I left Dr. Hill's office, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. The previous night's events were a harsh reminder of the complexity of the human psyche and the crucial role we play in providing care and support. Later in the day, the hospital social worker, Mary Thompson, approached me. 
She had been working on Jackson's case and wanted to discuss his follow-up care. I'm coordinating with mental health professionals to ensure Jackson gets the help he needs, Mary said. We're setting up counseling sessions and connecting him with support groups. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. It was heartening to know that Jackson would receive the care he so desperately needed. Mary's dedication to her work was evident, and it reassured me that despite the chaos of the night, there was a plan in place to help him rebuild his life. As my shift came to an end, I reflected on the lessons I had learned. The night had tested me in ways I hadn't anticipated, but it had also deepened my understanding of the importance of compassion and resilience in our field. The work we do is not just about treating physical ailments, it's about addressing the emotional and psychological needs of our patients, often under the most challenging circumstances. The sun had set once more as I left the hospital, but the weight of the previous night felt lighter. I knew that each day would bring its own set of challenges, but I was ready to face them with renewed determination. The world of emergency medicine was unpredictable and demanding, but it was also profoundly meaningful, and as I headed home, I was more committed than ever to making a difference in the lives of those who needed it most. The following morning, the weight of the previous night's events still lingered. I had managed a few hours of restless sleep before my alarm jolted me awake. The sun was already high in the sky as I prepared for another day at the hospital, my mind preoccupied with the aftermath of Jackson Wells's crisis. As I entered the hospital, the air felt different. The staff was quieter than usual, and there was a palpable tension that hung in the corridors. It wasn't just about Jackson anymore. It was about how the entire team would process and move forward from the night's events. My first task of the day was to review the notes and updates on Jackson's condition. I had been assigned to handle follow-up paperwork, which allowed me to process the incident from a more administrative perspective. As I scanned through the documents, I came across a detailed report from Dr. Hill about the night's events. It outlined Jackson's aggressive behavior, the steps taken to de-escalate the situation, and the subsequent care plan. It was a sobering reminder of the challenges we faced. Later that morning, I bumped into Dr. Hill in the break room. He was sipping his coffee with a contemplative look, and I could tell that he was reflecting on the previous night's chaos. I decided to approach him. Good morning, Dr. Hill, I said, trying to sound upbeat despite the lingering anxiety. I've been reading through the report. It's clear that you managed a difficult situation with a lot of skill. Dr. Hill looked up, a faint smile playing on his lips. Thank you, Rachel. It's never easy, but we do what we can to help our patients. The key is to stay focused on their needs and provide support where it's needed most. I nodded, but I could see the strain in his eyes. How do you manage to stay so composed? It's hard not to get overwhelmed. It's about balance, Dr. Hill replied, leaning against the counter. You have to compartmentalize your emotions and focus on the task at hand. It's not always easy, and it's important to have outlets to process what we go through. Talking with colleagues, taking time for yourself, and finding support are crucial. Our conversation was interrupted by a knock on the break room door. Mary Thompson, the social worker, entered with a concerned expression. Rachel, Dr. Hill, I wanted to update you on Jackson's situation. We're coordinating his transition to a long-term mental health facility. It's a critical step in his recovery. Thank you, Mary. I said, feeling a sense of relief. I'm glad to hear that he's getting the help he needs. Mary's face softened. It's a process, and it won't be easy, but we're doing everything we can. The goal is to provide him with the tools and support to cope with his struggles. As the day progressed, I found myself reflecting on the broader implications of the incident. The hospital was buzzing with quiet discussions about the night's events, and there were murmurs of how to prevent similar situations in the future. The incident had prompted a review of emergency protocols and security measures. During a staff meeting later in the afternoon, the hospital director, Mr. Jameson, addressed the team. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of everyone involved last night. It was a challenging situation and you all rose to the occasion. We will be reviewing our emergency protocols and enhancing our security measures to better handle such incidents in the future. The room nodded in agreement, and I could see the determination in my colleagues' faces. Despite the stress and trauma, there was a shared commitment to improving our practices and ensuring the safety of both patients and staff. 
After the meeting, I had a chance to speak with some of my colleagues. We discussed the need for additional training in crisis management and the importance of mental health support for healthcare professionals. The night had highlighted the need for a holistic approach to dealing with crises, not just for patients, but for those of us on the front lines. As I wrapped up my shift and prepared to leave, I felt a sense of cautious optimism. The challenges of the night had reinforced the importance of teamwork, resilience and ongoing support. The hospital was a place of constant motion and unpredictability, but it was also a place where we could make a real difference. Driving home, I thought about Jackson Wells and the impact his crisis had on all of us. It was a reminder of the fragility of the human condition and the critical role we played in providing care and support. I was determined to approach each day with renewed dedication and compassion, knowing that our work, though difficult, was profoundly meaningful. The sun was setting as I arrived home, and the day's events began to feel like a distant memory. I was grateful for the support of my colleagues and the opportunity to contribute to a system that, despite its flaws, aimed to offer hope and healing. As I settled into the quiet of my evening, I resolved to face whatever challenges came next with the same resolve and empathy that had guided me through the night's trials. The days following the incident with Jackson Wells were a whirlwind of activity. The hospital's response to the crisis had sparked a series of reviews and discussions aimed at improving our emergency protocols and ensuring the well-being of both patients and staff. It felt like the entire team was rallying together, united by a shared purpose to enhance our preparedness for future challenges. One morning, as I walked through the hospital corridors, I noticed a distinct change in the atmosphere. The usual hum of activity seemed tinged with a newfound urgency and focus. Meetings about crisis management and staff training had become a regular part of our routine. The administration was determined to learn from the recent events and implement measures to prevent similar situations. I found myself reflecting on the impact of Jackson Wells' case on my own perspective and approach to my work. The experience had opened my eyes to the complexities of mental health issues and the profound effect they could have on individuals and the people around them. Dr. Hill had been instrumental in guiding me through the aftermath of the incident and I had come to appreciate the depth of his experience and wisdom. One afternoon, I approached him with a question that had been on my mind. Dr. Hill, I began as we sat in the staff lounge during a brief break, how do you balance the emotional toll of working in such a high-stress environment? I've been struggling with how to process everything from the Jackson Wells situation. Dr. Hill looked thoughtful for a moment. It's definitely a challenge, he admitted. One of the most important things is to acknowledge your own feelings and find healthy ways to cope. This job can be emotionally draining, but it's crucial to take care of yourself so that you can continue to provide care for others. Do you have any specific strategies that help you? I asked, eager for practical advice. Finding time for yourself is key, he said. Engage in activities that you enjoy, whether it's a hobby, exercise, or spending time with loved ones, and don't hesitate to seek support from colleagues or a mental health professional if needed. We're all in this together, and it's important to lean on each other. As we spoke, I felt a sense of relief. Dr. Hill's words resonated with me, and I began to understand the importance of self-care in maintaining my own well-being. It was a lesson I knew I needed to take to heart. Later that week, I participated in a debriefing session with the hospital's mental health team. The goal was to evaluate the response to the Jackson Wells incident and identify areas for improvement. The discussion was thorough and candid, with input from various departments and perspectives. Mary Thompson, the social worker, led a segment on the importance of mental health support for patients in crisis. We need to ensure that our approach is not just reactive, but proactive, she emphasized. By providing early intervention and ongoing support, we can help prevent situations like the one we faced with Jackson. The meeting was enlightening and reinforced the idea that our work extended beyond immediate care. It was about creating a comprehensive support system for those in need, addressing their mental health concerns before they escalated into crises. As part of the hospital's new initiatives, I was involved in organizing workshops on crisis management and mental health awareness for the staff. These sessions aimed to enhance our skills and knowledge, equipping us with the tools needed to handle similar situations in the future. One evening, as I was preparing for a workshop, 
I reflected on the progress we had made since the Jackson Wells incident. The workshops were a tangible outcome of our collective efforts to improve and learn from our experiences. I felt a growing sense of pride in being part of a team that was committed to making positive changes. The day of the workshop arrived, and the room was filled with staff members eager to participate. Dr. Hill and Mary Thompson were among the facilitators, and their expertise added depth to the sessions. The workshops covered various topics, from de-escalation techniques to self-care strategies. During a breakout session, I found myself leading a discussion on handling emotional stress and maintaining mental health. Sharing my experiences and learning from others was both therapeutic and enlightening. It was clear that we were all navigating the complexities of our roles together, and the support from one another was invaluable. As the workshop concluded, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. The Jackson Wells incident had been a challenging and intense experience, but it had also catalyzed positive change. The hospital was evolving, and so was I. The lessons learned had deepened my understanding of the importance of mental health support, both for patients and for those of us providing care. Driving home that evening, I felt a mixture of exhaustion and fulfillment. The road ahead was still uncertain, and the demands of the job would continue to test me. But I knew that the experience had made me stronger and more resilient. The commitment to self-care, ongoing learning and teamwork were now integral parts of my approach to work. The night was quiet as I arrived home, and I took a moment to appreciate the tranquility. The events of the past few weeks had been transformative, and I was grateful for the opportunity to grow and adapt. As I settled into my evening routine, I felt a sense of readiness to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Knowing that I had the support and skills needed to navigate the complexities of our work with compassion and resilience. The days following the Jackson Wells incident felt like a blur of activity and reflection. The hospital had been busy implementing new protocols and holding workshops to address the lessons learned from that chaotic night. Yet amidst the routine, an unsettling feeling lingered in the back of my mind. It was as if the shadows of that night were refusing to fade. One evening, as I prepared for my shift, I noticed a subtle shift in the atmosphere at the hospital. The usual buzz was tinged with a sense of unease. The staff, while maintaining their professionalism, exchanged wary glances and hushed conversations. It was clear that the memory of Jackson Wells still loomed large. As I entered the emergency room, I was greeted by the usual sounds of a busy night, the hum of medical equipment, the soft murmur of voices, and the occasional distant clatter. I took a deep breath and steeled myself for whatever might come, hoping for a quiet night. Around ten o'clock, the tranquility was abruptly shattered by the sound of the emergency room doors slamming open. My heart skipped a beat as I looked up, expecting to see another crisis unfold. To my shock, it wasn't a patient in distress, but a familiar face. Dr. Gregory Hill. Dr. Hill's expression was one of concern, and he was accompanied by a tall, imposing figure. As the figure stepped into the room, I recognized him immediately. It was Peter Wells, Jackson Wells' estranged brother. I hadn't expected to see him again, and the sight of him stirred a mixture of anxiety and curiosity within me. Peter Wells had a weathered appearance that spoke of years of hardship and conflict. His eyes, though weary, were sharp and intense. He carried a sense of urgency and determination that was impossible to ignore. Rachel, could you join us in the consultation room? Dr. Hill's voice was calm but firm. Peter has some important information that we need to discuss. I followed them into the consultation room, my mind racing with questions. As we settled into our seats, Dr. Hill gestured for Peter to speak. I understand this might be unexpected, Peter began, his voice gravelly. But I need to explain why I'm here. I've come to give you some context about Jackson that might help in understanding what happened. Dr. Hill nodded encouraging Peter to continue. Go ahead, Peter. We're listening. Peter took a deep breath before speaking. Jackson and I have been estranged for years. Our family went through a lot, and we lost touch. When I heard about the incident at the hospital, I knew I had to come. There are some things about Jackson's past that might shed light on why he acted the way he did. As Peter spoke, it became clear that Jackson's struggles were deeply rooted in a troubled history. He recounted the painful events that had shaped Jackson's life, a troubled childhood, 
the loss of their parents, and a series of personal setbacks that had left Jackson emotionally fragile. Jackson's behavior has been unpredictable for years, Peter explained. He's been battling severe mental health issues, but he never sought help. The stress from recent events just pushed him over the edge. The revelations were eye-opening. They painted a picture of a man who had been carrying the weight of his past for far too long, and it helped to make sense of the intensity of his actions that night. We've been working on finding Jackson the right kind of care, Peter continued, but I also wanted to apologize for not being there for him sooner. I realize now how important it is to address these issues before they spiral out of control. Dr. Hill listened attentively, his expression reflecting a mix of empathy and understanding. Thank you for sharing this with us, Peter. It helps to know more about Jackson's background and what he's been through. We'll continue to provide him with the support he needs. As the conversation wrapped up, Peter seemed to relax slightly. I appreciate your willingness to hear me out. I just wanted to make sure you had a full picture of what Jackson was dealing with. After Peter left, I found myself reflecting on the gravity of his revelations. The incident with Jackson Wells had been a wake-up call not just for the hospital, but for everyone involved. It underscored the importance of understanding the personal histories that shape individuals' behaviors and the need for comprehensive support systems. Dr. Hill and I spent a few more minutes discussing the implications of Peter's information. It's clear that Jackson's situation was the result of a complex web of personal struggles, Dr. Hill said. Our job now is to continue providing him with the care he needs and to ensure that we're addressing not just the immediate symptoms, but the underlying issues. As I prepared to leave for the night, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. The encounter with Peter Wells had been unexpected, but it had provided valuable insights into Jackson's story. It was a reminder of the human element behind every patient's case and the importance of empathy and understanding in our work. Driving home, I reflected on the day's events and the lessons learned. The complexities of mental health and the impact of personal histories were more apparent than ever. I was more determined than ever to approach my work with compassion and diligence, knowing that each patient's story was a crucial part of their journey toward recovery. The night was calm as I arrived home, and I took a moment to appreciate the quiet. The challenges of the past weeks had been intense, but they had also deepened my commitment to making a difference in the lives of those we cared for. As I settled into my evening routine, I felt a renewed sense of hope and resolve, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead with a greater understanding and a compassionate heart. The days that followed Peter Wells's visit were filled with a new kind of urgency. The hospital's focus had shifted to not only addressing immediate crises, but also understanding the broader context of each patient's situation. The revelations about Jackson Wells had sparked a series of discussions about how we could improve our approach to mental health care. It was a Wednesday afternoon when the next wave of challenges began. I had just finished a routine check of patient files when the emergency room doors burst open with an urgency that caught my attention. My heart skipped a beat as I looked up, bracing myself for another high-stress situation. In walked a young woman, visibly distressed and clutching her arm. Her face was pale and her eyes were wide with fear. Behind her, a middle-aged man with a rugged appearance followed closely, his expression a mix of frustration and concern. I quickly moved to their side. Are you okay? What happened? I asked, trying to remain calm despite the rising anxiety in my chest. The young woman, whose name was Sarah Mitchell, explained in halting sentences that she had been involved in an altercation with her estranged father, the man accompanying her, Daniel Mitchell. They had had a heated argument that had escalated, resulting in Sarah being injured. Her arm was clearly bruised and swollen, and she was in obvious pain. I guided Sarah to an examination room and instructed one of the nurses to start an initial assessment. Meanwhile, Dr. Hill arrived, taking in the situation with his usual calm demeanor. Dr. Hill, this is Sarah Mitchell. She's been injured in a domestic dispute with her father. I briefed him quickly. Dr. Hill nodded and immediately began to examine Sarah's arm. I'll take care of her. Rachel, could you please speak with Mr. Mitchell and get more details about what happened? I turned to Daniel Mitchell, who was waiting anxiously in the corridor. Mr. Mitchell, I need to get some information about what occurred. Can you tell me more about what happened between you and Sarah? 
Daniel's face was etched with regret. It was a misunderstanding that got out of hand, he said, his voice filled with guilt. We've had issues for years, and things just boiled over. I didn't mean to hurt her. As we spoke, I could see the weight of the situation pressing down on him. His distress seemed genuine, but it was clear that the conflict between them was deeper than this single incident. I took down the details and noted that Sarah might need additional support beyond just medical treatment. As Sarah was being treated, Dr. Hill took me aside. Rachel, this is more than just a physical injury. It's clear that there's a lot of emotional turmoil here. We should consider involving our social worker, Mary Thompson, to address the underlying issues. I agreed, knowing that this case, like Jackson Wells's, required a multifaceted approach. Mary Thompson was brought in to provide counselling and support for Sarah and to help address the family dynamics that had led to the altercation. As Sarah and Daniel left the hospital, it was clear that the situation had a lot of unresolved issues. Mary would follow up with them to ensure that Sarah received the necessary support and that steps were taken to address the underlying causes of their conflict. The incident with Sarah and Daniel Mitchell was a stark reminder of the ripple effects that personal struggles can have on individuals and their families. It underscored the importance of addressing not just the immediate medical needs, but also the broader emotional and psychological aspects of patient care. Later that week, the hospital held a team meeting to discuss the implications of recent events. Dr. Hill and Mary Thompson led the discussion, focusing on the need for a holistic approach to patient care. We're seeing more clearly than ever that our patients' issues don't exist in a vacuum, Dr. Hill began. Their personal histories, family dynamics and mental health all play a crucial role in their overall well-being. Our goal is to address these factors comprehensively. Mary Thompson added, it's important for us to integrate mental health support into our routine care. By addressing the root causes of distress, we can help prevent crises and provide better, more effective support. The discussion was enlightening and reaffirmed the importance of a collaborative approach. It was clear that the hospital was committed to evolving and improving its practices to better meet the needs of its patients. As the meeting concluded, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. The events of the past few weeks had highlighted the interconnectedness of physical and mental health and the importance of a comprehensive care approach. I was more determined than ever to contribute to this evolving vision and to support my colleagues in providing the best possible care. Driving home that evening, I reflected on the recent challenges and the lessons learned. Each case, from Jackson Wells to Sarah Mitchell, had reinforced the importance of empathy, understanding, and a proactive approach to care. The experiences had deepened my appreciation for the complexity of the work we did and the impact it had on those we served. The quiet of the night offered a moment of respite, and I took a deep breath, feeling a sense of accomplishment and resolve. The journey had been demanding, but it had also been profoundly rewarding. As I settled into my evening routine, I felt prepared to face whatever new challenges might come equipped with the knowledge and compassion needed to make a difference. The weeks following the incident with Sarah Mitchell had been transformative, both for the hospital and for me personally. The ongoing discussions about mental health, the new protocols, and the holistic approach to patient care were not just theoretical concepts, they had become integral to our daily practices. Each day I felt more aligned with the hospital's mission to provide comprehensive care and support. One crisp autumn morning, as I prepared for my shift, I found myself reflecting on how far we had come since that chaotic night with Jackson Wells. The hospital had become a place of learning and growth, and I was proud to be a part of the positive changes. As I walked into the emergency room, I noticed a familiar face in the waiting area. It was Jackson Wells, now under the care of the mental health professionals we had coordinated with. He looked calmer and more composed than I'd seen him before, and he was accompanied by a caseworker from the facility that was handling his long-term care. I approached Jackson with a mixture of apprehension and hope. Jackson, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Jackson met my gaze with a faint smile. Better, actually. I've been getting the help I needed, and it's making a difference. I just wanted to come by and thank everyone for their support. His words were heartfelt and it was clear that the care he had received was beginning to make a positive impact. I introduced him to Dr. Hill and Mary Thompson, who were equally relieved to see Jackson on the path to recovery. 
Mary Thompson took a moment to speak with Jackson, offering him reassurance and encouraging him to continue with his treatment. We're here to support you, Jackson. It's important to keep moving forward and to reach out if you need anything. As Jackson left the hospital, he seemed to carry a renewed sense of hope. The sight of him leaving with a sense of purpose was a powerful reminder of the difference we could make in people's lives. The rest of the day passed with a sense of quiet satisfaction. The hospital felt like a different place, infused with a spirit of collaboration and commitment. The staff worked seamlessly together, driven by a shared goal of providing holistic and compassionate care. That evening, as my shift drew to a close, I had a chance to sit down with Dr. Hill and Mary Thompson. We gathered in the staff lounge, reflecting on the changes and the progress we had made. It's been quite a journey, I said, feeling a sense of accomplishment. The improvements we've made and the way we've come together as a team are truly inspiring. Dr. Hill nodded in agreement. The incidents we faced were challenging, but they pushed us to grow and to re-examine our approach. It's been rewarding to see the positive impact on both our patients and ourselves. Mary Thompson added, The work we're doing is making a real difference. The support systems we've put in place are helping people find hope and healing. It's what keeps us going. Our conversation was filled with a sense of camaraderie and purpose. The challenges we had faced had tested us in many ways, but they had also strengthened our resolve and deepened our understanding of the complexities of patient care. As I prepared to leave the hospital, I took one last look around. The building, with its bustling activity and quiet moments of reflection, felt like a symbol of resilience and transformation. The journey had been demanding, but it had also been deeply rewarding. Driving home, I felt a profound sense of gratitude. The experiences of the past few weeks had shaped me in ways I hadn't anticipated. They had reinforced the importance of empathy, teamwork, and a holistic approach to care. The night was clear and calm as I arrived home, and I took a moment to appreciate the serenity. The road ahead was still uncertain, but I felt prepared to face whatever came next. The lessons learned, the support received, and the progress made had all contributed to a renewed sense of purpose and resolve. As I settled into the quiet of my home, I reflected on the journey and the people who had been a part of it. The work we did was challenging, but it was also profoundly meaningful. With a heart full of hope and a mind focused on the future, I was ready to embrace the next chapter of my journey, knowing that I had the skills, compassion, and determination to make a positive difference in the lives of those we served.